Okay, I'll start now. Um, so this is lecture three. Um, and I will begin with some um, brief reminders, um, a brief recap of what we did last week. And, um, and then the theme today will be to focus on, on periods. So the uh, main objects um, in this business are a pair of um, affine group schemes and a comparison isomorphism between them. So more precisely, we had G11B, which is the relative completion of gamma equals SL2Z uh, with respect to the inclusion, the natural map, rho into the Q points of the algebraic group SL2. Um, so B stands for Betty. Uh, this is just the, the group completion um, that I defined in the first lecture, but it has an interpretation as local systems, as I explained in the second lecture. Okay, so this is an affine group scheme. So it's a pro-algebraic matrix group, or projective limit of algebraic matrix groups, over Q. And it is equipped with a Zariski dense homomorphism Um, which I didn't give a name, but maybe rho tilde, from gamma into its rational points. So we think of um, this group as some sort of algebraic hull or algebraic envelope of, um, of SL2Z. Um, of course, an affine group scheme is just given by, um, de determined by its affine ring, which is simply a commutative Hopf algebra. Okay, so then the other uh, group in the game is the Duran relative completion, which I defined in terms of um, algebraic vector bundles on, uh, with an integrable connection on M11. Satisfying some conditions Um, and it's the, the Duran relative completion. Again, it's an affine group scheme over Q. So once again, it's given by a commutative uh, Hopf algebra. And these two things are related as follows. So there's a canonical isomorphism that I called COMP. Um, which, after extending scalars to C, is a canonical isomorphism between these two group schemes. So these two schemes become isomorphic after extending scalars. Um, then we know something more. We know something about their structure um, by the definition of relative completion. In both cases, we have an exact sequence um, they are extensions of the algebraic group SL2 by something which is pro-unipotent. In both cases. So this is uh, pro-unipotent, in other words, it's a projective limit of unipotent uh, matrix groups. A unipotent group is always conjugate to, you can always represent it by um, a subgroup of the group of matrices, I remind you, with ones on the diagonal and the rest above the diagonal. So it's a projective limit of these things. Um, so here um, I've written SL2B and SL2DR. So this can be confusing, but it actually clarifies things considerably. In both cases, it's just 
SL2. So SL2 beta U, SL2 dram is just the group SL2. The, the index is just to, to keep track of where we're working. And it's because in this comparison, which, which sends SL2 to SL2, SL2 beta U to SL2 dram, the comparison is non-trivial. So it's very useful to keep track of, um, of, of, of which copy we're working with. Um, so I should also say so the, the comparison respects this decomposition, so comp um, maps u11 isomorphically onto u11, etc. Um, and finally, um, we know something about the structure of, we know how the, the general shape of these groups. <coughs> so to, the easiest way to write this down is to define little u to be the Lie algebra of the unipotent radical of the Durand part, then this is isomorphic to uh, the completion of the A free Lie algebra on, on generators coming from modular forms. So last time, I called them, um, there were generators corresponding to Eisenstein series. And each of them comes with a copy of a, a standard representation of SL2 of um, rank 2n plus 1. And there were, for each cusp form, there's uh, a two-dimensional space of, of such representation. So if you choose a basis, you've got two, um, two generators for every cusp form of weight 2n plus 2. And this corresponds to Eisenstein series of weight 2n plus 2. So this is for n bigger than or equal to 1. Right, so these generators are not canonical. Um, that's important to emphasize. Okay, so this lecture is going to be is going to be entirely about trying to understand this this isomorphism comp, and that's going to give some interesting numbers. So the definition um, is the follows: the ring of multiple modular values. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how to denote these. Sometimes I think I write MMV gamma, uh, possibly uh, I've written, written in one place or other Z gamma, possibly. Um, so this is the, the, a, a ring of numbers, a subring of C. Um, it's the smallest ring, R contained in C such that, it's the smallest Q algebra, such that um, the comparison map is defined over it. So G in other words, it's all the numbers that turn up in the comparison map. Uh, maybe a more satisfying way to say this is um, the comparison map is induces a map on, on the affine rings that goes in the opposite direction. So uh, if you take an element uh, uh, in the affine ring of the Durand group and you apply the, the, the induced map, the, 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 the comparison map on the level of the affine ring, then you get something in this Q algebra and certain coefficients which appear. And R is the ring generated, sorry, MMV gamma is the ring generated by all those coefficients. Okay, so um, this, this ring does not have a, a canonical basis in any way. Um, so for now, it's just, just a ring. And um, what I want to do is sort of dig down into this and try to make, uh, understand as much as we can about it. So the first thing we can do by, um, by, the, by the first point 
is uh, use the fact that gamma is a risky dense in, 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 um, in the Betty relative completion. So we have a map from SL2Z into the Q points of the Betty relative completion. And then we can apply this comparison map. And that sends us into the complex points of um, the Dram relative completion. And in fact, <coughs> in fact, we know by definition of R that it necessarily lands in MMMV gamma. That's the definition of MMMV gamma. It's the smallest ring, so this is true. And this map is a risky dense. Um, so <coughs> that means these numbers are, are going to be generated by the images of elements in SL2Z. <coughs> now, uh, gamma was just the topological fundamental group of M11 with respect to a tangential base point, which I defined last time, d by dq, <coughs> which I sometimes also call 1 at infinity. It's a, a unit tangent vector at the cusp. Um, and uh, as, as we all know, this is generated, SL2Z is generated by two matrices, which go by the name of S and T. And th these correspond to the modular transformations um, tor maps to minus 1 over tor inversion, and T is translation, tor maps to tor plus 1. <coughs> okay, so um, these, these elements, S and T, should be thought of as, as paths in um, M11, in, in the complex points of M11. So let's look at that. <coughs> um, so in the, so for T, um, it, uh, it all takes place in the Q disk. So if this is a picture of the Q disk, I remind you that Q equals e to the 2 pi i tor. Then uh, it's punctured at the origin. <coughs> and our base point was this tangent vector d by dq. And so the path t is, can be represented uh, as a path that goes along this tangent vector and loops once in the positive direction around the origin and then comes back along this tangent vector. So that's T. Uh, so T is a loop around the cusp. And indeed, it must be by, by this formula. Tor goes to tor plus 1 corresponds to winding around the origin. So how do we think about S? Well, if this is a picture of the upper half plane, um, then we have the cusp up here and the tangent vector sticking down <coughs> like this. Then we think of S as um, a path from um, the cusp with this initial velocity, the tangent vector, all the way down to zero. So in fact, as a representation of, uh, of S, we can just take the imaginary axis. <clears throat> so this picture is slightly misleading. So we're working upstairs in the, in the upper half plane, of course, on the uh, orbifold M11, we should think of this, this is a picture of, of M11 with the cusp and some tangent vector sticking out, <coughs> then S is, is indeed a loop because this point zero is equivalent to the, the cusp zero is equivalent to the cusp infinity. So we should think of S as some sort of path in M11. <coughs> But, um, but when we work on the upper half plane, we shall think of it as a path between zero and infinity. Okay, so because um, uh, SL2Z is the risky dense and is generated by S and T, it turns out, as we shall see, that the ring of multiple modular values is generated as a ring by, um, the, by the coefficients of the image 
of T and S. So by that I mean we have these matrices T and S which live in SL2Z and their image is some element of this, um, this group and, and the coefficients are certain numbers. Um, so it turns out the coefficients of T are very uninteresting. They're just powers of 2 pi i. Um, though, though the element T itself is very important. Uh, this only produces uh, powers of 2 pi i. So all the information then is, is, is contained in this single element S. <coughs> so that's the interesting part. So before proceeding with this, let me just um, uh, give something more familiar because by now it's, it's increasingly well known and explain the analog in the case of P1 minus three points. Just so that uh, we get our bearings. <coughs> now this case is, is very slightly different because um, we're, we're not looking at the fundamental group but the groupoid. So we're going to look at paths from one point to a different point. We could take paths based at a single point, and in which case it would be very much closer to this pic to the M11 picture. But I hesitated to do that because I think that the path torsor is actually the more well-known um, setting. So let me explain that. <coughs> so here on M04, we have um, the, 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 the base points that one takes um, are the tangent vector 1 at the origin and the negative unit tangent vector at the point 1. Of course, this, these are not drawn to scale, of course. <coughs> and the, so the topological, so not fundamental group, but, but um, homotopy classes of paths from this tangent vector to the other tangent vector is um, is is what I just said. <coughs> so these are homotopy class of paths from zero to one, essentially. <coughs> There's there are a couple of paths that play play a, a key role. Well, there's one path that plays a very crucial role. So um, so we have this picture. Make it a bit bigger. Then there is the so-called uh, DCH or droit chemin, um, the straight path. From uh, it's a straight line from one zero to minus one one. So you just it's 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 really literally the the map from the the unit interval into um, c minus zero one the open interval into this along the real axis. So it just goes along with unit speed here and comes in unit speed here. <coughs> and that's indeed a path between two tangential base points because its initial velocity is 1 and its final velocity is minus 1 coming in. <coughs> um, so there's another a path that, that plays a role here. So you could take DCH but you could pre-compose it with a loop around the origin. So you could look at gamma naught. You could go around a loop around the origin and then go to one. That's another thing you can. That's another example of a path. And um, DCH. So that in in M11, that the role of the straight line path is played by S, and the role of this this little loop here is played by T. Um, so in in this setting, we work with unipotent completion. So um, the Betty. Um, torso of paths from 0 to 1 is the unipotent completion so this is unipotent completion and the Duram um, the Duram uh, the Duram version of the unipotent completion Same thing. Um, so this can be described quite explicitly. Um, let me put them over here. So the um, so O pi one Betty is a scheme 
and it's R points, so R a commutative Q algebra, so this is a, a, a scheme over Q, it's R points are given by the set of group-like formal power series, so invertible power series in two non-commuting variables which satisfy some algebraic equation. So I wrote this down in the first lecture, I think. Group-like formal power series. <coughs> um, so I gave a delta of uh, xi equals 1 plus, oops, 1 tensor xi plus xi tensor 1. And the Duram, um, the affine ring of the Duram torso of paths is really the Q vector space uh, generated by words in two non-commuting letters, E0 and E1, where E0 corresponds to the differential form dx over x, and E1 corresponds to dx over 1 minus x. <coughs> so I don't want to give an entire course on P1 minus 3 points, but this is just to, um, to, to fix ideas um, and, and to have a concrete analogy. So in this setting, we have a very, very similar setup. The topological, uh, the, the space of the homotop, the topological fundamental group or the, the, the space of homotopy classes of paths maps into the Betty uh, fundamental, fundamental torso of paths, more precisely into its rational points. And then we have a comparison isomorphism. So here I forgot to say um, exactly as in as before we have 0 pi 1. We have a comparison isomorphism. So then this goes to O pi 1 into its complex points. So it's an exact analogy of what I mentioned earlier. And what this does is it takes this straight line path, which is just the path from 0 to 1, and it sends it to something over here, which is very famous, which is the Drinfeld associator. So concretely, the Drinfeld associator can be, can be written down, um, at least uh, at least formally, um, so it is a uh, uh, it is it it is a, a again a formal power series um, uh, indexed by so words words in e naught e one and then the coefficient of each word is what's called a shuffle regularized multiple zeta value. And this is a formal power series in two letters, uh, E0 and E1. And um, we know what it looks like. It starts off 1 plus zeta 2 E0 E1 minus E1 E0, depending on certain sign conventions. etc. It goes on forever. And uh, it can be viewed as the generating series of multiple zeta values. So um, after that long digression, um, I hope that motivates exactly what's going on in this picture for M11. We've got exactly the same situation. The small difference that we've got the fundamental group with respect to a base point and not a torso of paths. In that respect, it's, it's simpler. Um, so the element T, or rather it's the, the image of the element T over here, is, very, is really, the loop, it's really the same element as, as this, this gamma zero here. It's just a loop around the origin. Um, so T only produces um, powers of 2 pi i. But it's, it's very important. It's... Um, I'll just say this because I might not have time to explain it. it it's some kind of non-abelian analog of the Peterson inner product. Peter's 
than in a product on modular forms. <coughs> um, and in, in principle, we can determine its image completely. Um, so it can be computed. Uh, can be computed completely. Whereas well, the element S, on the other hand, we should think of as the analog of the Drinfeld associator. In fact, they're, they're related in some way um, for M11. And it's in the same way that the Drinfeld associator, it, its coefficients generate multiple zeta values, the coefficients of this gadget um, generate. Um, multiple modular values. <coughs> but it's, it's much, much, much richer than the Drinfeld associator. Much more complicated beast. All right, so now I want to explain um, relations between these numbers. And as I progress, it will become more and more uh, concrete. So for the Drinfeld associator, it's well known that it satisfies um, the associator, sorry, the, the, the associated relations, namely the hexagon and pentagon relations. Um, and so I want to write down an analog of that for, um, for M11. And so these are uh, co-cycle relations. <coughs> So we had um, this exact sequence, unipotent radical for um, where dot is either Betty or Duram relative completion. <coughs> and um, in particular, the comparison isomorphism Uh, restricts to or well, induces a comparison between these um, copies of SL2. So let me write that down explicitly and dispense with it. So SL2 Betty, as I mentioned before, is just SL2, right? It's just a, 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 a label. And same with SL2 Duram, it's also just a copy of SL2. But the isomorphism is non trivial. So on the level of points, if I take a matrix A, B, C, D, then what this does is um, it maps it to another matrix, what I'll call gamma bar, and um, it multiplies B by 2 pi i and C by 2 pi i inverse. Um, and so this is a, a minor detail that can be ignored as a first approximation. But it's, it's, it's very irritating if you don't distinguish the Betty and the Dram copies of SL2, otherwise you get yourself into a pickle. <coughs> so it's important to, to bear this in mind. Um, and the, re the reason for this will become clear uh, when I talk about the underlying Hodge structure. Um, uh, the fundamentally, the, the, uh, this SL2 is the, is the acts on the um, H1 of the Tate elliptic curve, and, and that H1 is a copy of a, a Q of 0 and a Q of minus 1. Um, and that explains this 2 pi i sneaking in. <coughs> OK, so now to, to proceed, let's, um, let's, we have to choose a splitting of this, um, of, of one of these short exact sequences. Here you mentioned in the JSAP part, what is the order part of C? Sorry? So this is on points. So I, I've, what I've done is I've written it down on complex points. Here, th here this is a, a, a point in SL2 oh, okay. Betty bracket C, and I've written down its image in SL2 Duran bracket C. <laughs> yeah. It's not the product. The, 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 this, this, is, this is a product of schemes, but uh, if, uh, to write this down, you can, it's an, well, an exercise, you can write down what this is on the affine ring. And <laughs> exactly. But I've just written it on points. <clears throat> um, so now let's choose a splitting of this Duram exact sequence. 
Um, so this is possible by, um, on the level of points by Levy's theorem, or version of Levy's theorem, you can always split um, such a short exact sequence of algebraic groups, schemes, on the level of points. And on the level of actual group schemes, this is a theorem due to Mostar. So what we have then is, um, we're looking at this, exact sequence and we're going to choose a splitting. So what that means is we're going to write G11 Duram is isomorphic to SL2 Duram U11 Duram. And so this means I'm viewing SL2 acting on the right So right action on, on the right of U11 Duram. Okay, so this splitting is non-canonical. It depends on some choices, unfortunately. Um, and I, I do not believe that there is a, a, a canonical such splitting. <coughs> um, okay, so now we do the, the, the same thing. We rewrite this map. So we had gamma SL2Z going into G11 the rational points of G11 Betty, by the comparison, this gives a map into the complex points of G Duram. And then we've chosen our splitting. So we land in the complex points of this semi direct product. And what that does, it takes a matrix gamma in gamma and it maps it. In the first component, it maps it to gamma bar, which is essentially the same matrix gamma, but with this irritating um, two pi i's um, creeping in. And, and something else uh, that I'm going to call uh, C gamma. And of course, the ring of multiple modular values are generated by the coefficients of the C gammas for all gammas, or all elements gamma in the group SL2Z. Um, so th this, map is a, this map is a homomorphism. And so that's equivalent. Um, it's equivalent, it's a very uh, one line calculation, that this is equivalent to the equation CGH equals CJ slash H. So a slash is my notation or the standard notation for a right action times CH, where the multiplication takes place in U. So this is, holds for all GH in gamma. So this is um, an equation which defines a non-abelian group co-cycle. And as a result, it gives quadratic relations between the coefficients of these, of these um, uh, elements. <clears throat> right, so let me briefly remind, remind you some notation concerning non-abelian group cohomology. So this is a digression. So if we have um, a group G, so any old group G, acting on um, a non-Amelian group, um, so in my notes I've called it A, stupidly, but it, it's not necessarily abelian on a uh, non-Amelian group, so a group scheme, for example then this, the set of cocycles, Z1, G, A, the set of non-abelian cocycles is the set of maps from G into A uh, satisfying precisely this equation. So here are my actions, uh, my actions on the right. <coughs> 
for a left action, the formulae are very slightly different. Um, so such that C G H equals C G slash H C H. So that's the definition of a non-abelian uh, group co-cycle. And there's an equivalence relation on these. So, so this is a set, there's no, uh, it's not like cohomology of, uh, uh, sorry, it's not like um, uh, group co-cycles on an abelian group. There's no, um, there's no group structure here. This is, this is just a set um, and it contains a distinguished element, which is the, the trivial co-cycle where G goes to the identity. The, every element of G goes to one. So it's just a pointed set. But on that pointed set, there's an equivalence relation. So we say that two non-abelian co-cycles are equivalent um, if they differ by a co-boundary. So that means, um, so if there exists a B in A, an element B, such that um, C prime G equals B inverse slash G C G B for all G and G. And if I didn't mess up the formula, you can check that, that C prime defined in this manner, that any, any C prime defined in this manner by twisting via an element B indeed satisfies this uh, co-cycle equation. So that's an equivalence relation. And we say that something is a co-boundary if it's, if it's equivalent to the trivial co-cycle. In that case, it would be the co-cycle given by G maps to B inverse slash G B for some B. It's indeed a group action of A on the right. Exactly. Yes. Um, absolutely. So, um, and then, you're right. So, um, so H1 is the, um, the quotient. So I won't use this so much this time. Um, Modulate the equivalence relation, and we think of this as, as a, you can think of this as a base, and Z1 as a, as a, uh, as a, as a, a total space over H1, and the fibers, as you say, admit an A action. And, um, and that, that's a good way to think about it. <clears throat> and then the final remark I want to say is, um, which is very well known, is that this, this space of co-cycles can be interpreted as, as just a HOM, so if you, in fact, I've already used it up here. So Z1GA is canonically in bijection with the, the group homomorphisms from G into, group homomorphisms from G into the semi-direct product of G with A, which are the identity on G. So this is maps um, G, maps to G something, and, and this something defines a co-cycle. So we've already um, used this um, to define the co-cycle that we're interested in. Um, so that's a very easy thing to prove. <clears throat> So by, by this final remark, the, the non-abelian co-cycles are simply the homomorphisms of a group. And since we have a presentation for SL2Z, where's it gone? Uh, here, then we can explicitly write down all these, um, all, all the equations, uh, all the necessary and sufficient equations for C to be a group co-cycle. So the first remark um, is that minus one in gamma um, acts trivially, um, and that's going to imply that, so it's very easy to show that the, the co-cycle uh, evaluated on the, the, the element minus the identity um, is going to be trivial. And uh, th this is also related to the fact that, that um, uh, the local chart on M11 was the stack quotient of the punctured disk by plus or minus one. Um, and it's also related to the fact that there are no modular forms 
of odd weights for SL2Z. Um, so that's different ways you can think about this fact, but C of minus 1 is, is, is 1 in this business. And now um, that means we're really interested, we've really got a co-cycle of um, gamma modulo plus or minus 1, which is also known as PSL2Z. And this has a presentation. Um, so the image of S in this quotient satisfies S squared equals 1. Maybe I'll put congruent to 1 just to emphasize that, that this identity is in, is in the quotient. Uh, so S, S, the, the matrix S itself literally satisfies S squared equals minus 1. And it satisfies, and likewise, U cubed equals minus 1. So U cubed is congruent to 1, where U is the element t dot s, which is um, 1 minus 1, 1, 0. So from this presentation, it means that um, we get an immediate corollary that uh, this co-cycle equation, which, which is up here, um, so let me call it something. Dagger. Oh, I can leave this down here. Um, so the co-cycle equation, dagger, is equivalent to, um, well, first of all, by definition, C, it's literally saying that C is an element, a non-abelian co-cycle of SL2Z in U Duran 1, 1, C. And that's in turn equivalent because we have this explicit presentation and um, by this, this remark that to define a homomorphism on the group, it suffices to define it on generators satisfying equations given by the relations, you immediately get that S, S, S bar times CS equals 1. Um, and I'm going to run out of room. Um, let me... Let me squeeze it in here. Um, and we get C uh, U U bar squared C U U bar C U equals 1. So we get these two equations coming, coming, coming from this presentation. And where C U equals C T slash S bar C S. So there we see very explicitly that, um, that the, this, this co-cycle, the value of this co-cycle on any group element is completely determined by its values just on S and T, S and T are generators. And so you have to just specify two elements in U11 Duran, S, C, S, and C, T. And you've got a co-cycle if and only if these three equations are satisfied. And so these um, are a complete set of equations, and they imply relations between multiple modular values. And the important thing to remark is that, again, I, I've said this before, that CT, we essentially know it completely. It just involves 2 pi i's. So you think of CT as being known somehow you can view this as, as some, a system of equations satisfied by CS. <coughs> right, so now, um, now we want to actually compute something. So we, we have some relations satisfied by these, um, by these uh, numbers. So it's, actually we, we, it's as if we've, we've written down formally what Z is, and we know some equations are satisfied by its coefficients. But we now want to actually try to compute some integrals and, um, and, and, and get a grip on some of the coefficients explicitly. Sorry? These relations will be equivalent. Well, which relations? The between the N and the... Um, so, so the co-cycles give relations, but they're not the only relations. So there are, um, 
there are some other relations that we know that um, are sensitive to the form a certain combination of MMVs are multiple zeta values. And the reason for that is because there's a geometric reason, which I haven't talked about, which is that um, uh, approximately this, these group schemes act on the fundamental group of the punctured elliptic curve, which is a mixed tape motive. So that gives you, that mixes in multiple zeta values into this picture in some complicated way and gives some other relations. But we don't know, but still, e even throwing that into the mix, um, we still don't know all the relations. Um, and there seem to be a lot more. We don't know really where they come from. This is already, um, this is already a very, very strong constraint, though. It's, it's very powerful as it is. Um, so I'll say some more about that, actually, la later on. Um, but even more fundamentally, the, di the difference here is that every, every period, every um, coefficient here can be written down as an integral, an iterated integral of some differential forms along this path DCH from, from 0 to 1. And um, unfortunately, in, in the case of SL2Z, you can't do that explicitly um, in, in all cases. So you can only do that for a, a certain piece of um, the relative completion. And so let me explain uh, what that is and how that works. Um, so periods and um, what I call the, the totally holomorphic, or sometimes just the holomorphic quotient. Okay, so the issue here is that there is no there's no explicit description of the affine ring of OU11 de Ram. So th these would correspond to differential forms, or iterated integrals in differential forms, that we would then integrate along S, i.e. from 0 to infinity, and they would give numbers. And that's the analog, so I just erased it. But in, in the case of P1 minus 3 points, this was very explicit. It was just a tensor algebra on two generators corresponding to dx over x and dx over 1 minus x. The reason why there's no explicit description, so we can write down descriptions of this, but it's not explicit because there are non, essentially non-trivial massy products uh, in this business, in, and, and the non-trivial cut products, and you have to choose a sort of system of massy products. You have to construct some kind of um, minimal model to do something explicit here. So that's a bit of a pain. Um, there's some recent progress by Ma Luo in his thesis uh, on how to write down, uh, how to ex turn, explain this in terms of certain complexes. But it's not going to be as nice as P1 minus P points where you can just write down a basis um, completely explicitly. And I, I don't know if there's some, some natural choice of, of a system of higher massy products in this setting, which would solve this issue. We don't know that yet. But what we can do for now, we can define, um, we can describe uh, a piece of this, um, which I like to call the totally holomorphic quotient. So what that is, is, um, so we have U11 Duran, and it has some quotient U11 Duran hull. Now, uh, sort of informally, U11 Duran, or its Lie algebra, was, was generated by some Eisenstein classes, and then two generators for every cusp form, EF prime and EF double prime. And here, informally, this is generated by throwing away the EF double prime and just keeping the Eisenstein classes and, and the, the holomorphic part of the, the modular, modular generators. <clears throat> so this, I have to say some words here, th this is not Mativic. So th this U11 Duram does come from algebraic geometry uh, and it has a mixed hot structure, but this thing does not. Um, it's just a it's, it's a Duram thing. It only exists in, in the Duram realization. So it is not Mativic in whichever sense you wish to interpret Mativic in any reasonable sense. So for example, it does not have a mixed hot structure. 
or it does not have a Betty analog or a Betty analog. So it's defined in terms of the Hodge filtration. In fact, you can define it as the I haven't spoken about the Hodge structure on this yet, but you can just define it to be the quotient by the normalizer of F naught, where F is the Hodge filtration on Euduran. Okay, but so it, but it turns out that this thing can be can be written down explicitly, and its periods can be written down explicitly. Um, so let's let's do that now. Oh yeah, so what that means, I forgot to write a line. So what that means is that this is some subring OU11 to ram hole is some subring inside U11 to ram, and it has a completely explicit description. And this is going to give us differential forms that we can then integrate along um, S and T. <coughs> What is the path corresponding to S? Um, the path from zero to infinity. In the upper half plane, it's 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 this. Yeah, it's the imaginary axis. Uh, you can't sit on the disk because it, um, it it leaves the disk and and goes on a big detour and comes back into the disk. The, the disk is just sort of something local up up here. <clears throat> um, so now let me describe, so we're going to get more and more concrete as, as the lecture progresses. Um, so recall some notation. Um, we had, um, I had a vector space Vn de Ram which was um, a certain algebraic vector bundle, which was the nth symmetric power of the, the H1 of the universal elliptic curve at the fiber d by dq. Concretely, it's, it's just a vector space, and we can choose, well, we, we have a, a set of generators, um, x to the i, uh, that I'm going to denote by a blackboard bold x and y. And this has a right action of gamma. And in fact, we already saw this, the, the Betty version, which was the, the fiber of this canonical local system at the same tangential base point, uh, was, oh, uh, sorry, so I messed this up. This is a direct sum Q. Right, so it's just a, a, a vector space of homogeneous polynomials in two variables of degree n. And this, we definitely saw, was um, this vector space with the, the, the right action of gamma. Um, and the point of having these different notations is because SL2 Betty and SL2 Duram uh, are, are, are not quite the same when the comparison isomorphism has this uh, factor of 2 pi i. So this is just to keep track of that. And uh, y corresponds to 2 pi i y, and x corresponds to x. So I as a first approximation, you can just ignore this distinction between x's and y's and just, just take the standard Betty x and y in the modular forms literature. But if you actually want to work here, you have to be very careful with these different normalizations, depending on, on where you're working. Um, this is due to the comparison. This is exactly the comparison morphism between SL2 Betty and SL2 Duram. It's a, a completely equivalent. I, I don't want to dwell too long on this. It's really trivial, but it's um, it's just important to, to do things carefully. Otherwise, um, things become incredibly confusing, and none of the none of the Hodge theory works out if the weights are all wrong. Um, so now let. Um, Curly B N be a Q basis for the space of cusp forms um, of weight N with um, rational Fourier coefficients. So 
So I call this uh, Sn <coughs> uh, in an early lecture. And so then we can write down this thing explicitly. It's just a tensor algebra. <coughs> Um, so then the affine ring O U one one dr whole is nothing other than the tensor uh, coalgebra uh, generated so on on the Q vector space um, generated by certain symbols. I mean, the definition is it's just the tensor, uh, the tensor algebra on a space of modular forms. But I, I, it's nice to write down a basis um, to, to do computations. Um, so having chosen a basis, this can be made very con concrete. We have symbols um, E 2n plus 2 x to the i y to the j where i plus j equals 2n. And these correspond to, uh, for all n being equal to 1. So these correspond to Eisenstein series. And um, so e4, e6, et cetera. And then we have the cast forms. So before we had two generators, ef prime and ef double prime, um, one corresponding to holomorphic modular forms, the other weakly holomorphic modular forms. But here we throw out the weakly holomorphic and we just keep the holomorphic part. So we just have a single generator for every cusp form now. Um, so i plus j equals 2n and f, a basis element, and 2n plus 2. <coughs> so these are cuspidal generators. Um, so tensor coalgebra um, is just the tensor algebra <clears throat> so if you, ha if you have a, a V of vector space, it's just TV is just the direct sum V to the tensor N. Coalgebra means that there's a co-product on it. <clears throat> so um, precisely we have a basis of, uh, this is a Q vector space, the basis is given by words in the symbols, uh, in, in these symbols. So we take uh, words in these symbols, non-commuting uh, non letters, and the co-product is given by deconcatenation. So if you have a word w1 up to wn in certain symbols, then the co-product sends it to the linear combination i equals 0 to n. <clears throat> okay, um, so here the notation gets a little bit um, confusing. So what I like to do is, if you had a word, for example, I don't know, e4 x squared and then e6 y cubed or something, then it's convenient because these x and y's are the same letter. It's convenient to put to, to put a little subscript. Subscript. So the the, the one, the leftmost one gets a, a, a subscript one. And so the, the, the ith letter gets a subscript i. So that's just a bookkeeping notation. Um, you don't have to do that. But it's just, um, I, I, like, I like to do this in, in my papers, and I might do it later on. So if, if you see the, the subscripts x and y, it's just keeping track of which, in which slot, um, wh which x belongs to which, to which letter. <coughs> OK, so. Um, we had this, this co-cycle gamma going to the full uh, Duram, uh, uh, the unipotent radical of the Duram relative completion. And this depended on a choice of splitting. Um, and then now we can look at something smaller and, and look at its image in the holomorphic quotient.
And so now we get um, a new co-cycle. So we had this, this, this huge co-cycle, the full co-cycle C. And now we have um, a smaller co-cycle where we've thrown out a lot of the periods. We've thrown out all, all the, the iterated integrals which aren't totally homomorphic. Um, but already this is going to be very interesting. And so what we get from this then is automatically, since this is a group homomorphism, this holomorphic co-cycle is whole, yeah, sorry, my, it looks like HD, it's, it's whole, my writing is bad. Yeah, thank you. Whole, standing for totally holomorphic. And this gives us a co-cycle in, in this quotient. <coughs> and now the, the point is that, um, so here's a, a key point that, that I, I can't explain yet without doing some Hodge theory. Um, and that's that this, this co-cycle depended on a choice of splitting of an exact sequence at the very beginning. Um, now if you choose that splitting to be compatible with the, the, Hodge, the Hodge theory, and you can do that, then it turns out that um, this bit, the, the part on dr whole actually splits canonically. So this co-cycle is actually canonical. It does not depend on any choices. And there's a very good Hodge theoretic reason for that. Um, yeah. <coughs> so, um, so it does not depend on the choice, on any choices of splitting. So provided your, your initial, initial choice of splitting respected the Hodge and weight filtrations, then, then this is some part in the Hodge filtration and it, it, it separates things out and the SL2 is just, um, can, can be split off um, very easily. <coughs> okay, so, th so this thing is canonical, so we can try to help to write it down. And its coefficients are regularized uh, iterated integrals um, <coughs> also known as uh, iterated Eichler or Shimura integrals so what I meant to say was that the coefficients are regularized iterated Eichler Shimura integrals so these were defined by by Manning a few years ago um, where there isn't the word regularized, so in, in, in the convergent case. So <clears throat> this is something you can write down very explicitly, <clears throat> and that's what we're going to do. So we could we could take a break a break here, or we could just press on and finish early, depending on what you prefer. Take a break. Okay, so we'll take a very brief five minute break and then we'll write down some iterated integrals. Okay, so I'll explain now how to calculate uh, these totally holomorphic periods. Um, so, first, a notation. Um, given a, a modular form, let me write F underline tor to be. 2 pi i f tor x minus tor y to the 2n d tor. Um, if f modular of weight uh, 2n plus 2. So I've been a bit inconsistent over this. Sometimes it's convenient to normalize this by 2 pi i to the power 2n plus 1. Here, it's convenient to normalize it just with a, a, a 2 pi i. Um, it doesn't make much difference, but um, sometimes I've used this notation to mean something very slightly different. First remark, um, which won't play a role, is that if we write this in terms of the parameter q and rewrite these Betty generators as Durham generators, then this is x minus log q y to the 2n d log q. And so what happens is that the y eats up 
um, eats up the, the, well, all the two pi i's get eaten up. And um, you see that this is actually rational. Um, and so what do we think of F FTOR is, is thought of as a section of um, V2N tensor omega 1 on the upper half plane. Okay. And so ev every holomorphic model of forms gives you some section of this trivial bundle over the upper half plane. And um, we define um, a one form, a formal one form, omega whole, to be um, so we sum over n um, for all, all cusp forms of weight n. We take a basis of cusp forms. Um, And we take um, some symbol for every cast form, and uh, the symbol keeps track of this particular one form. You can do this in a basis-free manner, but this is convenient for computations. Uh, so that's the, the cuspidal part, and then um, the Eisenstein series, uh, 2n plus 2, so that should be n being equal to 1, underline tor. And then we had this Eisenstein, this symbol e two n plus two. And this is this is the Eisenstein series that's normalized to have completely rational. So the first, the coefficient of q is just is just one. And it has rational q coefficients. Okay, so now um, let me keep that there. Now uh, we can take iterated integrals in that. And this was um, this was first done by Manin in some uh, two two very short but very nice papers uh, a few years ago. So for all um, two points tor one to tor two in the upper half plane, uh, define. So this was done by Manin. Um, I whole. So the integral from or the transport, if you like, from tor 1 to tor 2, is a formal power series 1 plus um, this plus integral from tor 1 to tor 2, omega whole, omega whole, plus dot, dot, dot. And this is a formal power series in, um, in EF prime xi, yj, um, e2, n plus 2, um, xi, yj. So I'm using, I'm mixing metaphors here. There's, I'm taking the Durham generators, but the Betty x and y, um, which is a not very hygienic thing to do, but it, it simplifies the formula considerably. So that's why I'm, and it's actually what's done in the modular, form liter modular forms literature. So it's confusing at first. You've got a Durham generator with the Betty guys here. It's just important that that's said once. This is one. It's this formal differential form. Yep. It's it's an it's a formal. Pa it's like an yeah. Uh, so Chen calls this a formal power series connection. And it, this is its transport. So this is non-commutative formal power series. So um, I don't know if this is, is literally a special case of. Of, of Chen's work on iterated integrals. Or it, in the case, it's a very slight variant because you've got uh, differential forms with values in a, in, a, in a vector bundle, in a trivial vector bundle. So it's a, a tiny um, modification of Chen's general theory in, in this case. Um, so let me, if you're not familiar with this, let me briefly remind you what an iterated integral is. Um, so this was developed extensively by, by Chen um, in a long, over many years. Um, and I think in, in the physics literature, it was also considered and bears the name of, bears Dyson's name. 
Um, though the theory was really worked out, the, the vast majority of the foundational work on this was done by Chen. Oh, you have the dates. 1970? I thought it was earlier than that, but um, OK. Um, OK, I take your word for it. Um, and so the, the basic idea, I'll be very brief because this is very well known. If we take um, some differential one forms, some smooth one forms, and I can put, you know, if we've got, they could be vector valued in a trivial vector bundle, for example, in, in this case, with the sections of a vector bundle, and it's very, it makes hardly any difference. Um, smooth one forms. On a, on a smooth manifold M um, and we, uh, we give ourselves a path, gamma, and we take an open path. So if you have a smooth path uh, on M, then the iterated integral of uh, this, this sequence of one forms along gamma is defined to be the, in physics, it's called the time-ordered uh, integral. It's integral over simplex. Uh, Fn, Tn, Dtn, where um, Fit is sorry, FIT DT is defined to be gamma upper star omega i for i equals 1 to n. So what's going on here is that when you've got a smooth map from the interval to m, if you have a one form on m, we can pull it back to the interval 0, 1, on which we have the coordinate t. And so any one form on the interval can be written some function times dt. And so what you do then is you take um, so this is just omega 1, written parametrically. Um, the idea is that you, you, you take a primitive of it, uh, take an indefinite integral from 0 to t, then you multiply it by the next, so that's a function, now you multiply it by omega 2, and that gives you a 1 form. You take a primitive of that to get another function. You multiply it by the next differential form, integrate, multiply, integrate, multiply, integrate. So that's the notion of an iterated integral. This is a time order integral. Exactly, time order. So, um, so the way I like to think of it is if, if you have a, a path integral, you imagine a, a point traveling along a, a path, and what's going on here is that you're sort of firing endpoints along a path, one after the other, and you're sampling the path as you're sort of firing uh, uh, endpoints uh, in sequential order. Okay, so there's a huge theory here that I'm not going to go into. The aim of chain was to define a Durham theory for, for passing for fast. Exactly, yes. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so let me skip that theory because uh, it could be an entire course. Um, and just write down the properties of, of this, particular, um, uh, this particular instance of a, a, a formal power series of iterated integrals. So I should just say briefly that iterated integrals satisfy lots of properties. If you take the product of two iterated integrals along the same path, that can be written as a linear combination of iterated integrals along that path via the so-called shuffle product formula. Um, there are formulae for what happens when you compose paths, um, when you reverse paths, and so on and so forth. Um, so in this case, what some of these formulae give the following um, so uh, the, the point I should make is that, um, in fact, because um, this form omega is closed, this path does not depend, this thing does not depend on the choice of path. So it's, um, it's independent, and because um, the upper half plane is simply connected, uh, it's independent of the choice of smooth path between Tor 1 and Tor 2. So it's really a function of the endpoints Tor 1 and Tor 2. And that's, that's because um, 
this, this, this uh, differential form is integrable. In other words, it's, it's closed and it's, it's wedge product with itself. Vanishes, which is clear because we're on a, on a, on a one-dimensional, complex one-dimensional space. Okay, so having said that, um, this is a function of two variables. Two, so uh, I hold of, uh, the integral from t, tor 0 to tor 2 is simply the product of non-commutative formal power series Right, um, then it satisfies the differential equation um, so this is I whole omega whole tor 1 minus omega tor 0 I whole t0 t1 tor 1 tor 1 so when we when I write omega whole on the side um, we think of these symbols E F prime and E two hundred two as acting via left and right multiplication, respectively, on formal power series. Um, there are shuffle product identities, which which uh, means that, that if you take any two coefficients of this power series and multiply them together, they can be written as a linear combination of other coefficients. Um, in other words, the, the, the vector space generated by the coefficients forms an algebra. And finally, something which is some, 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 some sense new in this situation because it's not a general feature of Chen's theory, but as everything else is. Uh, what we gain is uh, the action of SL2Z, and these integrals are equivariant. So. So this is the only feature which is a novelty. Um, and the reason for this is because um, the differential form we're integrating in the first place is itself SL2 equivariant. And that's going to be very important. OK, so now um, this is these are some integrals from Two, b between two points on the upper half plane. Now I want to take one of these points to be um, the cusp. And things are going to diverge. So we need to do a regularization with respect to the tangent vector at the cusp, which is playing the role of our base point. So now let me explain to you very concretely how to do that. It's very straightforward. Um, so we need to define. And, and the problem is, is the cusp forms pose no problem at all because they go to zero very fast in the neighborhood of the cusp. The problem of the Eisenstein series, which, um, which have, the, the, which have a, 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 con a zero Fourier coefficient, and that gives you um, divergence as you go to infinity. So the thing to do is to isolate out this divergence and take uh, what's essentially the residue of this one form in the Q-disk. And as I just said, the, all the cusp forms drop out. All we get is the zeroth Fourier coefficients of the Eisenstein series. So this is uh, some kind of residue of omega hole at Q equals zero. And so th this notation here for any modular form F naught underline tor will be defined to be 2 pi i, and then we just take the zero Fourier coefficient, x minus tor y, 2n d tor, where f is the a and f are the, the Fourier coefficients of f. So for a cusp form, it, it gives zero, it vanishes altogether. And then now for, for any um, points tor 0, tor 1 in, in C. So here we think of C, the meaning of C is that it's really the tangent space at the origin of the disk. That's the geometric meaning of this, this C. It's, it's the tangent space to, to M11 at the cusp, M11 compactified at the cusp. Um, but we can take uh, iterated integrals with these, and, and let's call that I whole infinity. Um, 
tor 0, tor 1, and it's the same thing. So it's uh, the inter iterated integrals, but now of, of this, this uh, differential form here. So this is something very explicit. We, we know that the residues, uh, so that the constant terms of the Eisenstein series are just Bernoulli numbers. So omega hall is um, some formal power series, some completely explicit formal power series whose coefficients are Bernoulli numbers. Um, and so we can put the two pieces together and define the regularized iterated integrals ah. so define um, i hole just of tor so you can you can write if you prefer you can write this tor comma infinity but i just write it as tor um, and the definition is you take the limit as epsilon goes to the cusp of i whole to epsilon times i whole infinity epsilon zero. So there's a, a very uh, nice geometric reason for why this formula should be what it is. Um, I've given lectures about this before and I, and I don't have time here so let's just take this as a definition. Um, and you can believe me that, that this, this, uh, this is converges very nicely as epsilon goes to infinity. Essentially this part sort of cancels out all the divergences in this iterated integral and it converges uh, extremely fast. So another convenient notation is to write this, to define this to be the iterated integral from tor to the tangent vector at the cusp of omega hole. So we think of this as a formal power series where we've just taken the upper limit of integration before here, tor 2, to be the tangent vector at the, at the cusp. And this is the definition. Okay, that, that, that's what this notation means now. And from that you can extract very concrete, explicit formulae for computing these iterated integrals. So these are the regularized with respect to um, the tangent vector, the unit tangent vector, at the cusp. So this thing now is turns out to be the unique solution to a slightly different, uh, well, essentially the same differential equation, but now it's just a function of one variable. So d of this equals minus omega whole tall high whole tall, and um, the constant of integration or the initial conditions are fixed by the fact that its value at the tangent vector at the cusp is just 1. That uniquely determines this power series of iterated integrals. And what the second equation, so this is the same differential equation as before, what this um, condition means, uh, another way to think of it is that there is some sort of regularized limit as tor goes to the cusp at unit speed, so along this tangent vector, um, that it tends to, if you regularize it in some way, it, its limit is just one. Okay, so, um, half an hour. So this is very explicit and um, this, this convergence is, um, is exponentially fast. So it's very convenient to compute with just uh, two or three Fourier coefficients of a modular form. You can get these uh, numbers for any value of tor to um, hundreds of digits very quickly. Um, so then how, how does the group SL2Z act? Well, for all gamma, we have An immediate property of this uniqueness in this differential equation is um, this equation. C 
C whole gamma. So uh, you could you could take this as the definition of C whole gamma, if you if you're analytically minded. Um, I define it a different way, but it's um, this is completely equivalent. And so here's so C whole gamma is a formal power series in these uh, symbols, and that's by the definite by how I wrote down the definition of Durham hole. You can also think of it as a point in a complex point of this group scheme. Um, so this equation you can check immediately. Um, so if you take this equation and apply it with gamma equals g h, and apply it with gamma equals g and gamma with h, then you immediately deduce the co-cycle equations. So that's a, a, a very simple exercise. That the co-cycle equations for c hole follow from this uh, formula. That's the definition of c gamma. Sorry. The first line is a definition. You can take so I, I define it from a top-down approach, and this is um, this is a formula for for c gamma hole. But if you you could take it as a definition if you like, this is a perfectly good definition. Um, and so this is um, z one gamma u. Okay, so these iterated integrals satisfy shuffle product relations and these co-cycle relations. Um, so in particular, they're determined by the value on t and s. So from this formalism, you can show that the value on t is, in fact, it only sees what's happening in the neighborhood of the cusp, and it only depends, therefore, on this, the, inf the infinite part of I whole. So it, it only depends on, uh, on this power series here, which is obtained by integrating omega whole. So it only sees the Eisenstein series, and it's essentially some completely elementary integral involving Bernoulli numbers. So here you're going to get Bernoulli numbers, and here you're going to get products of Bernoulli numbers, and then you get products of three Bernoulli numbers, and so on. Um, but it's completely elementary, and you can compute it explicitly to all orders. Um, so it only involves the residues of the Eisenstein forms, um, and therefore only involves Bernoulli numbers. And of course, powers of 2 pi i. So we can write this down explicitly. And then sort of the meat is S, and um, again, this is mysterious, but we can write it using, by messing around with this formula, you can, you can write it down like this. So you can look at just iterated integrals from, from i, the, uh, which is in the upper half plane, to the cusp. So uh, s i equals i. It's a fixed point of the involution s. And this has super fast conversions. Okay, so now um, having um, written down these um, holomorphic iterated integrals, um, I now want to explain, give some examples. And the simplest examples in the case of, of length one, in other words, a, a single iterated integral. And in that case, we retrieve the classical theory of periods of modular forms. So I'll dispense with that, and then I'll say something about length two. Examples. So the first example is where we just look at a single iterated integral of a cusp form. So it's just uh, a piece of this, so the, the first non-trivial term in this expression. Um, so we take an element in our, this is our basis of cusp forms with rational Fourier coefficients. It doesn't have to be on our basis, but it's just convenient. I wait two n plus two. Um, and then we can take the coefficient 
of, so we have this formal power series C whole um, gamma. So this is some, some formal power series in, in all these non-commuting variables. And we take the coefficient corresponding to E F prime. So the coefficient of E F prime in this power series is C whole gamma E F prime. That's the definition. That means that take the coefficient of this single letter in this power series. And that's going to define a co-cycle in V2M. So it's going to be an abelian co-cycle. And the reason for this is if you take um, my non-abelian co-cycle equation, which I've erased, but it's C whole GH equals C whole G slash H, C whole H, and just read off and think about what it means to take the coefficients of a letter of length for one, then what that gives you is exactly the equation C whole G H E F prime equals C whole G E F prime slash H plus C whole uh, H E F prime. So, t so taking off just the, the, the linear part, um, so the, the, the terms of length one in this expression uh, essentially abelianizes it, and you get this classical abelian co-cycle equation. So this is very standard in the theory of modular forms. Uh, so there's a f from the general formula we get C whole on S. So the value on T is, is zero, it's not very interesting. So I should maybe say C T whole E prime F is zero. That follows from this expression here. So it's, it's a cuspidal co-cycle. And the value on S is essentially the integral from S inverse the tangent vector to infinity to tangent vector to infinity of F tor d tor. But in fact, because this uh, modular form um, vanishes at the cusp, we don't need to take a tangential base point at all. We can just ignore that fact and take a classical integral from 0 to i infinity, and that's going to be perfectly convergent. So up, up to some normalization of 2 pi, this is exactly the Eichler integral, or eichler schimmer integral. Um, so this is a, a, a big subject and has been studied in great detail. Um, so you can uh, expand this as a polynomial in X and Y, and you get integrals of, of F tor times a power of tor, which is nothing other than a, a Mellin transform of F. And the Mellin transform of a modular form is its L function. So to, to cut a long story short, you can write this in the form uh, some k equals 1 to the 2n minus 1, of some coefficient, which is elementary, and I can't be bothered to write down, times the value of the L function of f at a point k, x to the k minus 1, y to the 2n minus k minus 1. Um, and so this is, let's call this, let's call this pf. Um, which is called, also called the period polynomial of the cusp form F. So uh, up, to some, up to some even power of 2 pi i, there's some, some normalization. So the L function here was defined by Hecker. Let me remind you, LFS is defined to be the sum of the Fourier coefficients of F over n to the s. And this converges for all real part of s sufficiently big, and you can be precise about this. So there's something funny about this, um, the definition of the L function, um, which always seems very strange, and that it's that you don't, th this definition also works for Eisenstein series, but you never take the first Fourier coefficient. You take, you start with a, a1 and not a0. And that's always sort of struck me as being slightly strange, because the, the functional equation for this L function comes from 
the, the modular behavior of f with respect to the inversion s. And if you, cut, if you remove the, the, the first Crawford coefficient, you, you break that invariance completely. So it's kind of strange that this, that this L function defined in this manner, where the sum starts at 1 and not 0, still satisfies the function equation. But actually, if you think about it, that truncating at 0 is exactly this tangential base point. So if you work out this formula, and I, I regret that I don't have time to do it, if you work out this formula in length 1, what it does is that you take the holomorphic integral and you subtract something, and that exactly has the effect of, it exactly explains this trick of Hecker's to, to get the, the L function um, in, in all cases. Um, so that, that's a very, very nice little lemma, it's a nice remark, and I regret that I don't have time to explain that. It's interesting only for the Eisenstein series, but it becomes absolutely crucial in, in higher length iterated integrals, you really have to regularize in a, uh, in a careful way. Um, and, and the formula is more complicated. Um, but but it, the, when you do this, uh, this Hecker business, it, it, it's always strange. You've got an integral from, you've got essentially the Mellin transform from 0 to infinity. And you've always got this, this weird term of integrating from 0 to 1 of the residue. So essentially, you integrate from 0 to infinity of f minus its constant Fourier coefficient. And then there's an extra term, which is an integral from 0 to 1 of the constant term. And uh, the meaning of that extra term, integral from 0 to 1, is an integral in the tan it's the integral along the tangent vector of length 1 in the tangent space. Um, and that's very satisfying because it gives a very clear geometric meaning to these um, classical formulae. Anyway, so I, di I digress. Uh, this is very well understood. Um, and then the, let me just spell out the co-cycle equations in case you haven't seen it before. The co-cycle equations uh, for S and T amount to functional equations on F, so on PF, which are called the period polynomial relations. So that's this, the, this first equation here um, corresponds to this. And then the second equation corresponds to a three-term equation. So these are called the period polynomial relations. Um, and an example, to have time quickly. So uh, an example, if we take um, F is the Ramanujan cusp form of weight 12, then we can write this polynomial explicitly as a holomorphic period, which is real, omega plus 36 over 691. So I hope these coefficients are correct. Um, and I didn't copy them down incorrectly plus, so it has an even part and it has an odd part. So the odd part is, is given by the, the other holomorphic period. Um, so these polynomials are very famous. And they, they show up in all sorts of places. So they're the, the, the smallest non-trivial solutions to these sets of equations. OK, so then a remark here. So here we're only looking at the holomorphic iterated integrals. That means we're only integrating f. Um, if we want to capture the quasi-periods, as I mentioned in the second lecture, last lecture, if we want to get the quasi-periods, so again, this is something that's not at all been considered uh, classically. Um, then to capture them, we need, we need to consider the full co-cycle CS, not just its um, totally holomorphic part. Just C whole S. So here, these iterative integrals are given by holomorphic modular forms. We're, we're studying this at the moment. But I claim that in the length one case, you can do these same calculations. And 
that will involve integrating a weakly holomorphic modular form with, with poles at the cusp. You have to be careful how to do that. But then you can capture the quasi-periods of the motive of F. So there, there's some numbers that I call eta plus and I eta minus. This cycle were known to Eichler, was it? Uh, th th this is, this is Eichler, Eichler Shimura, yeah. So this is very classical and it's been studied in great detail by uh, Zagier and Manin studying in the 60s, I think, and there's a huge literature on this by now. Um, so I should mention, yeah, so, well, actually, um, so Manning did a lot more. I regret I don't have time to talk about it. So Manning proved something very beautiful, that something called the Universal Coefficients Theorem, that um, he showed that you can act, that there's an action of the Hecker operators on these polynomials. And so once you have an action of the Hecker operators, you get the eigenvalues, and you can regenerate your modular form. So, so the, the period polynomial completely determines the modular form uniquely. And I regret I don't have time to talk more about it, but uh, he, he explained how to get the Hecker operators to act on these polynomials. So it's a very beautiful theory. And we don't really know how to generalize this um, in any reasonable way in, in higher lengths. So these, these give some extra relations. Um, some, some extra relations over and above these, these co-cycle relations satisfied by these um, satisfied by these, these period polynomials. Um, okay, so now the second example is the case of an Eisenstein series, and this is less classical. I mean, this is a, equivalent to stuff that's been known for a long time. And in particular, I'm sure that Ramanujan knew the formula I'm going to write down. But um, what's new, or what wasn't known, was this whole notion of tangential base point. So these formulae were sort of ad hoc. Um, but now, equipped with the notion of tangential base point, we get a completely canonical, we can define a canonical Eisenstein co-cycle. And that's by integrating all the way to the tangent vector at the cusp. So in the past, you had to truncate somewhere or regularize it some choice. But this is completely canonical. And the formulae equivalent to formulae in the literature. So what we get then is the coefficient of E2n plus 2 is an abelian co-cycle, which is canonical. Now let me uh, write it down. Ten minutes, okay. Um, so first, we define a rational co-cycle. So there's a lot of confusion on this in, in, in the literature. So I think it's good to spend some time, a little bit of time on it. So first, let me define a rational co-cycle that I call E naught. Um, and there's a, a slick way to write this down as a generating series, but I think it's more instructive just to give the formula. Um, so there's a Bernoulli number, B2n over 2n factorial. So this looks a bit strange, but there's a reason for it. Then you take x plus y, 2n minus 1 minus x to the 2n minus 1 over y. So this is a polynomial. The y factors out. And the, the such is in, obtained is an easy integral um, around the cusp. I gave the formula earlier. It's, it's an exercise to do that. And the value on s, the quick way to, to get this is, is through the, um, the L function of the Eisenstein series, which is a product of zeta, Riemann zeta functions. And if you take the value of a product of Riemann zeta functions, uh, what you find um, is this expression with products of Bernoulli numbers. Okay, so again, I, I hope that I didn't miscopy this formula, but it's in my papers somewhere. And, and so this expression with products of Bernoulli numbers um, comes up an awful lot uh, in this theory and the theory of multiple zeta values. It's very interesting. So then the holomorphic um, Eisenstein co-cycle then um, of an Eisenstein series is 2 pi i 
times this rational co-cycle plus a co-boundary term 2n factorial over 2 and it involves a Riemann zeta function. times a co-boundary term. So this is a co-boundary. So I gave the formula earlier in the first lecture, I think. I'll give it again. So the co-boundary is on a vector. So delta naught of v on gamma is um, v minus v slash gamma. So for when, when this is evaluated on t, the element t, this doesn't appear at all. You just get the value of e naught on t. But on evaluated on s, you get this formula evaluated on s plus some zeta value times y to the 2n minus x to the 2n. And this is very interesting because it means as a cohomology class, the, the zeta part drops out completely. So this transcendental part disappears, and you just get a rational. So the cohomology class associated with Eisenstein series is rational, and that's in accordance with the mann drinfeld theorem. But as a co-cycle, it's not rational. It's got some transcendental, conjecturally transcendental coefficient. Um, and that's going to be extremely important um, later on. OK, so that's the length. This is everything in length one, and it's completely classical. So that was the length one story, and we've completely described it pr pretty much. And it's, uh, it corresponds to the abelianization of the relative completion, and it's classical. So things start to get interesting in length two. And here, um, we don't know so much. I'll just say briefly what some things I do know. Um, the first interesting case is to look at two Eisenstein series. So the advantage of Eisenstein series is that they are totally holomorphic by nature. There's no non-holomorphic, weakly holomorphic counterpart. So we see everything. We can compute everything with these iterated, uh, regularized iterated Eichler integrals. So we want the coefficient of a word uh, in two Eisenstein series in this power series. And this it defines some gamma cochain in V2M tensor V2N. So this thing you can in turn break up into SL2 uh, representations. It'll have many copies. Um, so this is quite a rich object. It's got many different um, bits to it. And the very compact way to write the co-cycle equations on this thing are, are if you like, the relations between the coefficients uh, the coefficients of this, this co-chain, can be encoded, I claim, by the following co-cycle equation. So this is a gamma co-chain. It's in C1 V2M tensor V2N. And the most slick way of writing down these equations is in terms of a two co-cycle, C whole E2M E2N plus 2 equals the co-cycle E2M plus 2 uh, whole. The whole is redundant here. C whole um, E2M plus 2. So this is a cup product. So the nice thing about this formula, it's a sort of recursive expression that, that uh, gives you a formula for, for all of these coefficients in terms of the um, co-cycles of Eisenstein series, which you've completely written down explicitly. And we see straight away we're going to get some odd zeta values, the two odd zeta values, and the product of two odd zeta values for starters. Um, and then, and then, then um, this is going, that's going to do, completely determine this up to an actual co-cycle, um, which will satisfy the, the classical co-cycle equations. And those numbers, those coefficients, are go they're going to appear, for example, in weight 12, you'll get, you'll get the exact these polynomials, but times some new coefficients. And um, they can be computed to very high orders. And the question is, what, what are they? 
So let me just summarize um, what the techniques are. So a regularized iterative integral of two Eisenstein series is a very interesting object. Um, what do we get? Well, we get multiple zeta values. Get some non-trivial multiple zeta values occurring. And that's essentially in the same way here. We get, we get a sort of co-boundary term, and the coefficient is uh, an mzv. And the depth here can be up to four. <coughs> um, then the main technique for computing uh, this is using the Rankine-Selberg method. So it's slightly involved, so I won't say anything about that. But using the Rankine-Selberg method, which, which a priori is, relates to something different, but you can use it to do, this to do part of this calculation, what it produces for you is some coefficients proportional to the L function of every cusp form at non-critical values, so for all values k bigger than or equal to the weight of f. So these are, these are non-critical non values. of all cusp forms. So again, it's perhaps slightly surprising because the, the Eisenstein series, so out of Eisenstein series, you're getting cusp forms. And um, when we see the hot structure, it'll be even more surprising because the Eisenstein series are somehow Tate. But um, there are good reasons why it produces um, periods of, of motives of modular forms. So but then plus we get something else, which is kind of curious. We get a different, a, a, another period which um, which I didn't see in the literature, but it's a period of an extension of the motive of a cusp form, sorry, of, of the trivial motive, if you like, by a motive of a cusp form. Um, so this is a simple extension. So in a, in a category of Hodge, Hodge structures or something, by um, a pure modular motive. And um, this, L, this L function is essentially the regulator. So when you have an extension, um, there's a theory of regulators that gives you an invariant. And an invariant of the extension class is the regulator. And Bailinson's conjecture predicts that it should be a, a special value of the L function. But there's another period. Um, such an extension has, has um, another period, which is not canonically defined. It's defined up to some rational multiple. And I don't know what to call it. Maybe. At some point, I called it CFK. But we get this number as well showing up as a double Eisenstein integral. <clears throat> so that's basically it. We get um, multiple zeta values, essentially of two different types, occurring in two places, and only two places. We get single zeta values, products of single zeta values, two pi i's, L values of non-critical non L values, and some sort of companion period that goes with this. And before stopping, I'll just... Um, mention some other um, sort of slightly surprising consequence of the co-cycle equations is something that I call transference. And then I'll stop. Um, which is that the co-cycle, you don't see this, well, <clears throat> well you, okay, I'll say that in a minute. The, the, the co-cycle relations in length n plus 1 imply relations in length n. Um, so what I mean by that is imagine, <clears throat> imagine we, we knew what the co-cycles were for, for length 1 here, and then we want to solve, uh, s solve for this in terms of those. And the question is, is that obstructed or not? Um, so can you, having, having solved at length, having done an ansatz at length n, can you then find a solution in length n plus 1? The answer is yes for co-cycles in general, but the answer is no if you, if you fix the value of your co-cycle on t, which we know to all orders. So if you ask the problem, can we, having determined in length n, can we determine to length n plus 1 such that the value of the co-cycle on t is what it should be, then you find it is obstructed. And that obstruction is precisely the pizza inner product. And it gives something very interesting indeed. <clears throat> 
and then you find that the, 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 the liftability of these e equations to the next length actually provides a constraint at the previous order. And um, <coughs> for length one iterated integrals, it gives a, a well-known fact that so-called the, the conan zagier extra, so-called extra relation, satisfied by uh, these period polynomials, which is the, the, the period polynomial PF here of a cusp form is orthogonal to the period polynomial of an Eisenstein series. It's an extra relation. And in length two, we get something even more interesting. We find that the iterated integral of two Eisenstein series can be related to, <coughs> um, or a piece of it can be related to a piece of the iterated integral of an Eisenstein series and a cusp form. And this in turn, a piece of this can be related to um, a period of an iterated integral of two cusp forms. So I call this transference because um, coefficients from apparently very different parts of this, these iterated integrals, are getting transferred from, from one piece to an apparently very different piece. <coughs> Um, and as a final comment, so I expect, I expect that um, this could, should generalize, I don't know how to do it, that I expect that we find the special values of all rankin selberg L functions um, non-critical L values. I expect, so for small values of K, you can just use the classical rankin selberg method, but I expect them to occur for all values of K. As, um, as triple iterated integrals. And unfortunately, I don't know, what's missing here is that there isn't a good analytic technique for computing. Um, there should be some higher rank in Selberg method that enables you to uh, prove that some uh, higher iterated integrals give, spit out these numbers. And that's very important because Bainenson's conjecture is, is, is not known in this case. <coughs> I will stop there. Thank you.